just fun little kid things. It's great. Well, I hope you're having a wonderful day. I hope you have a Bible with you. If you have a Bible, we're in Ephesians chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, I see a couple of gentlemen in the back who look kind of scary and would like to get no, <laughs> would love to give you a Bible. If you just raise your hand, they'll bring you one. Anyone need a Bible this morning? Please feel free. We'd love for you to have this. Great. Thanks for that, Ryan. Wonderful. Anyone else need a Bible this morning? Really? Great, 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 great. Great. About two months ago in March, Philadelphia honored a home there as a historical site. It's William Stills home there. And um, I think what, next month, next, you know, actually just a couple, two, three weeks away, we'll celebrate William Steele's 116th anniversary of his death. He was born in 1821. Um, he was born actually in, in Maryland. Uh, his mother, Charity, uh, there was no man around at the time. Charity had four children, of which uh, William would be uh, end up to be the last, not the last of those four. But Charity, when she was in Maryland, had four children. She was the daughter of a slave, therefore she was a slave, and her children were slaves. Charity packed up her four kids and made her way out of Maryland and tried to get into New Jersey. New Jersey at the time was a, a free state in some aspects of the, our battle with slavery during those days. But she was caught. All four children were caught. They were taken back. She was beaten. And um, it wasn't long, though, before she tried it again. This time realizing that she was not going to be able to escape with all four children, she uh, just grabbed the two smallest girls and took the two girls and she said, I think these boys, age 8 and 10, uh, Levin was one, Peter was another, these two boys maybe can make it on their own. And so she left her two boys and took her two girls to New Jersey and this time she made it there. And she made it there and she married a man and they had 14 more children. William Still was the 14th born there in New Jersey. I said earlier in Maryland, but he was born in, in New Jersey. And she and her husband did everything they could to get the two kids who were still in Maryland back to them. But they had since been sold to somebody in Kentucky and then resold to somebody in Alabama. And so they were seem, seemingly lost forever. And so now... Charity and her 14 children did all they could to survive in New Jersey. When William Still was old enough, he left New Jersey and went to the free state of Philadelphia, the free Pennsylvania, to the city of Philadelphia. And William Still became one of the leading abolitionists and so-called father of the Underground Railroad very self-educated and prosperous man, William Still began to help people escape from their slavery. And he helped build the pathway from the south all the way to Canada for people to flee from oppression of those days. The story is told about William Still hearing of Jane Johnson. Jane Johnson was, uh, was in Philadelphia with her master. Jane Johnson was a slave. The Fugitive Slave Act had already been uh, put in place, which simply meant that no one could aid, help in someone trying to escape slavery. But William Still, knowing the law and understanding the law and having gone through it and worked with it himself, said, now here is a slave woman who has been brought to a free state, i.e. Pennsylvania. And so William Still, hearing that she was on the ferry boat in, in Philadelphia, went down and stood on the dock. Now he's a black man, of course, a former slave, and he stood on the dock and he yelled up onto the ferry boat to Jane Johnson. 
And he said, Mrs. Johnson, I want you to understand something. And he began to explain to her the law of the land. And he said, no one can come and take you away, but no one can stop you from walking away. And he just basically, what you and I would think of as preached up and down this deck, speaking to her and trying to help her to understand. And Jane Johnson walked down that plank and walked away a free woman. That wasn't the end of the story, of course, because the owner, um, a politician at the time, a man by the name of Wheeler, uh, was very angry, you can imagine. And so he filed suit against William Still. And Jane Johnson, who had been set free, left Philadelphia, went to New York, actually came back from New York and sat on the witness stand and said, no one coerced me, no one forced me, I walked away of my own free will, and William Steele was acquitted of all the charges. Here's a guy who just gave it all up, who stood in the gap. And when we come to Ephesians chapter 3, and we look through this particular passage that's filled, quite frankly, with a lot of doctrine, a lot of issues that I want to try and expose to you. I want us to hear the heart of the Apostle Paul, who was like a William Steele. I want us, I have this picture in my head of the Apostle Paul. I, I think of how, how strong-willed that he must have been to do some of the things that God had called him to do. If you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, you see all the things that happened to him, that is, being beaten and robbed and just left for dead and uh, left out in the deep, in the sea, and all kinds of terrible things that happened to him. And yet this man continued to forge ahead according to the calling of God on his life. And I see a very disciplined, kind of strong-willed guy. At the same time, when I look at passages like we're, we're going to look at, and many others that he's written about, I see a guy who has a very tender heart, who's got a great compassion for people. And for the will of God, there's this great combination going on in the character that I see of the Apostle Paul. And in this passage of Scripture that we're going to do, we're in chapter 3, verses 1 through 13, we're going to look at. And as I've already said, I'm just going to warn you right here, there's a, there's a lot of doctrine, there's a lot of things going on. But Paul has a heart message in the midst of this doctrine that I don't want us to miss. So let's take a look at it. Ephesians chapter 3. Let me get my Bible out. Now, if you've got an electronic thing, turn it on or do whatever you do. If you have a Bible, make sure it's turned right side up so you can read it. And let's try Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 13, taking a look at this mystery that's being brought to light. For this reason, it says now Ephesians 3, 1, for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to the holy prophet, uh, excuse me, apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you 
not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Let's pray and ask the Lord to teach us, would you? Pray. Lord, I pray that you would visit among us, that your word would be revealed to us, that we would be encouraged by it and to pursue you, to pursue knowing you, to pursue making you known in our world. Lord, I pray that you do this now in Jesus' name. Now, the outline for this is, is rather simple. I'm just looking at this phrase, bringing the mystery to light. And in each of these next three points, I'm just going to emphasize those three aspects of that phrase. The first one is not necessarily in order, bringing the mystery to life. I want to talk, what is the mystery? Then bringing the mystery to life, that is the one who's bringing. I want to take a look at what Paul is saying about himself and then bring the mystery to light. I want to know what it is and what's the light for us, what's the application for us. So, so first of all, bringing the mystery to light. Well, it clearly says, and this is probably the most explicit place in all of Scripture, that, that Paul, that the Bible makes clear of what the mystery is. But why call it a mystery? Why, why call it uh, you know, something that we haven't known before? And in, in some sense, we can take a walk through Scripture and we can see where God has said, that's where it's going to be. That's what it's going to be. This is what's going to happen. Ne next, this is what's going to happen. And yet, never being revealed, as this text says, as it is being revealed now. And now, the veil is off. It's being plainly revealed. I'd like to look at a few places, though, where it was actually spoken about. Maybe you can see why it remained a mystery. We all know that we were created in God's image, but immediately after being created in God's image there in the garden, we fell, that is, fallen man into sin, disobeyed, rebelled against God. And, and we fell right there. And God came on the scene. Where are you? We've talked about this a little bit before. And they have this conversation going on. And then God speaks to the man. God speaks to the woman. God even speaks to the serpent. And in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, he says to the serpent that there's coming a time when you'll be bruised. He shall bruise you on your head, and you will bruise him on his heel. And most believe that this is what a, a, a pre-announcement of what is going to happen in Christ. That yes, you have done this. You have entered the world. You have brought with you sin into the world and deceived in this fashion. Indeed, you have, you have bruised. But I want you to know there's coming a time when that vindication will come back on you. And so Genesis 3.15... Uh, Genesis 12, Genesis 12, 3, in what we call the conversation between God and Abraham and the covenant, the promise that he made with Abraham. And he, one of the things that he said to Abraham was is that through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. All the nations of the earth will be blessed. Now, that might be just through you, you're going to do welfare, or it could mean something else. Something else that at that point was, well, can we say it's just, just veiled. Somewhat veiled. Uh, but we look further into the time of the prophets. And, and through Jeremiah the prophet, uh, God says that, I, I implied there, there was an old covenant. That old covenant was with Moses and with Abraham. We made covenants along the way. But here in Jeremiah 31, 31, God says, I'm going to make a new covenant with you. In fact, it's not even going to be like the old covenant. And the new covenant that's coming is going to be significantly different. I will make with you a new covenant. I say, hmm, I wonder what he means by that. I live by the, I live by the Abrahamic covenant. I, I live by the Mosaic covenant. Here's Jeremiah. He says, God's going to make a new covenant. Well, okay, let's just move on. Ezekiel, Ezekiel says in chapter 36 that there's coming a time when you'll not live by these commandments and ordinances, but that God is going to take 
his spirit and he's going to put his spirit in you. He's going to give you a new, there's coming a time, sometime in the future, God is going to give you a new heart and he's going to take his spirit and he's going to put his spirit in you. That's coming. Wow. Kind of mysterious there. I don't really understand exactly what's going on until Jesus stood up among his disciples in the upper room. We did it last week. He raised up the cup. And what did he say? This is the new covenant. And every disciple in the room, right? Every disciple in the room said, Oh, so that's it. Eh. They didn't do that, did they? They're still asking themselves questions about what this means. I mean, even in the garden, when it's all coming down, what did they do? They ran. They didn't really... We we know after the resurrection, they're in the room together, and what's happening, and still not completely understanding what's what's going on, what's happening in the life. And this is the cup of the new covenant. Jesus said... Before he left in that ascension period, he said, now what I want you to do, and I'm trying to pull it together, it's not just a rehearsal of it, see if you can take the needle and put it through, make that necklace all together. He said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go into all the, I just want you to go to the Jewish people. Just go to the, is that what he said? Did he say just go to the Jewish people? He didn't say, I want you to go into all of the nations. Oh, so now the disciples are there and they got it, right? They don't got it. They're still not, it's not all put together. Even though what I'm trying to express to you, piece by piece, this mystery is being put together. Even Peter, in the book of Acts, in chapter 11, actually it goes back to 10, he saw a vision coming down a sheet, there were some animals in it that he wasn't supposed to eat according to the law. Oh no, I don't eat that stuff, that's bad, it's against the law to do it. And God said, do not call things unclean that I have said are clean. And then some people came and said, I want you to go with me to the house of a Gentile. And Peter, being the brilliant guy that he is, put two and two together and said, Aha! God's not talking about what I'm going to eat, but he's talking about a general principle about what I call clean, don't you call unclean. He wasn't supposed to go to a house of a Gentile, but he did because he understood what God was saying to him. And he went there and he preached the gospel to them and God visited upon them and saved the whole household. But now Peter's got a challenge. This is, this is, oh, some 30 miles away from Jerusalem. Now Peter's got to go back to Jerusalem and report to the other guys. He's got to go back to report to the other apostles. He's got to say, hey, guys, let me tell you something, what happened to me on the way to Jerusalem. On the way to Jerusalem, I preached the gospel to them repentance just like he did us wow and he preached to it and God indeed threw them right here is our text that even though he starts out by saying this is the mystery this is the mystery this is the mystery now he pauses in verse 6 and he says very clearly let's get this straight what is it this this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs members of the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Woohoo! I mean, I'm glad we get to Revelation chapter 5 and who's gathered around the throne in the times to come. It's people from every nation, tribe and tongue. We're all there. That's what this message is. And I'm saying to myself at the beginning of the week, saying, Got a lot of people in the room going to be really excited about hearing about this. I mean, you know, where's the point of the sermon? Okay, God's not just for the Jews. He's for the Gentiles. There may be some Jewish people in here. Welcome. Glad you're here. Most in the room are Gentiles. God is for you. That's great. But that's the mystery. That's the mystery. I think of uh, 
Second, uh, excuse me, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Do you have your Bible or your, your gadget? Your gadget can get there faster. Your device, excuse me. Gadget, device, whatever. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. This is Paul speaking to the Corinthians. This is what he says. Yet among the mature, he's talking about wisdom here, but he says here in verse 6, yet among the mature, we do not impart wisdom. Although it is not a wisdom of this age, excuse me, yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom. Get it right. Although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret a hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. You see, in these verses, he's simply saying, it was a mystery to everybody who didn't know what was going on. Didn't fully understand it. I think about the the disciples, even after the resurrection, the disciples on the road to Emmaus, walking along with Jesus is there now walking along with these men. And, and Jesus asks them the question, said, So, guys, what's happening? What's 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 going on? They look at him like, Are you the only person that doesn't know what's been happening in Jerusalem? The irony of that statement. He's the only one who knew what happened in Israel. He's the only one who really knows what happened in Jerusalem. He's the only one who knew, knows what happened from the cross to the grave and came. He's really the only one that knows, but they don't get it. And so he unfolds the scriptures for them. And he says, there I am, there I am, there I am. I would have loved to have been in that Bible study. Boom, their eyes must have been just bugging out of their heads, sitting there going, Wow, wow, fantastic. That's who, it was a mystery that they didn't understand. Paul says that he is bringing this mystery to light. Take a look at verse 7 now, back over into, into Ephesians chapter 3, verse 7, when he begins now. That's the mystery, there's the mystery. Wow. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace. What I want us to begin to see here is Paul and Paul's purpose for saying these things to them. Because in reality, this is a digression. This is a, this is a off the, oh, it might be what we might call a rabbit trail. It's a spirit-filled, God-ordained rabbit trail, but nonetheless... If we were to go to back into chapter 2, Bruce brought us a message about the prayer that's going on there. And, and the prayer begins, for this reason. And he says, I bow on my knees. Even later in this same chapter, look at verse 14. For this reason, I bow on my knees before the Father. He's going to do it again. He says the same thing again. In verse 1 of this, look what he says. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you know, and da -da 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 all the way from this verse right here in chapter 1, excuse me, verse 1, all the way through 13, is a digression. It's a, okay, I got something else to say. And there's something else to say is really, really important. So I want to make sure I get it in some place. And this is the place that he gets it in. And he says of this gospel in verse 7, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace. First of all, in bringing it, Paul, wants him, he does this over and over in his letters. What a man of integrity. He comes and he says, listen, the reason that I'm preaching to you, the reason that I'm writing to you is because of God's grace gift to me. Uh, this is not some human manufactured wisdom of my own but God's grace to me. God has made me a minister by the grace gift that he has given to me, which was given me by the working of his power. And so here I want to pause for just a moment and remind you a little bit of the context 
of, uh, of Ephesus and of the letter to the Ephesians. I've made a big deal about the cultural and the context in which they are. It's a religious syncretism. That is that there's a lot of religions being molded together. Uh, the greatest of which is to the temple of Artemis where they not only worship and do things like of a religious nature but they also acquire their, their money. They, 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 they get their cash from it. It's a commerce. It's a treasury center. This is the one who's fallen down out of the sky Got the zodiac around her, holds arrows and stars in her, each of her hands. She's the powerful goddess of the heavens. And infiltrated all through this text are what we call Paulisms. Say it again. Paulisms. Even in the verse that we just read a few minutes ago, in verse 6, uh, this mystery is, even that, even the word, wait a minute, Artemis is a mystery cult. It's a mystery how she just fell out of heaven and landed here. To use the word mystery is to talk the language of his context. To use the word mystery is to use the language the people around him understand and attach other, other meanings to. So Paul uses Paulisms when he says fellow heirs. That's all one word. Fellow heirs that he made up himself. Members of the same body is all one word. Members of the same body is all one Greek word that Paul made up himself. Uh, partakers of the promise, again, all one word. Paul is going out of his way. Uh, I do it all the time. My kids, I drove them nuts. Maybe some of you dads on Father's Day, you've got some words that you make up for your kids. They laugh at you. My kids, they laugh at me. Paul is making up words, not so somebody laughs at him, to make a point. He's over and over again, I don't know what... The, see this microphone? This microphone drives me nuts. You know why this microphone drives me nuts? Because it never stays in one place. I know last week it was flapping all over the place like that. Because, because, because one of you hugged me. I got this thing glued and stapled to the side of my head so that it doesn't keep flapping around, but I had to I had to finally take some of that super glue type stuff and glue it together so now it's practically molded into one piece. Boom. That's Paul. In three different words he wants to say Takers. We're one in the same body. He makes up words to do that. We're one in the same. And we didn't get that way by our own strength, but we got that way by God's power. And God's appointed me to preach to you by that same power. Secondly, about his preaching, about his ministry, about the one bringing this mystery to light. To me, though I am the very least of the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles. Now, this is long, but I'm just going to break it down into a simple statement. But to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone... That is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities of heavenly places. I think he's doing two things right here. First of all, he's saying God has called me to preach sound doctrine. He's called me to preach sound doctrine about God. He's called me to preach sound doctrine about God. Christ, and he's called me to preach sound doctrine about who and what the church is. He's called me to hold fast to sound doctrine, to preach the word of God, Paul says. All right, the second thing before that. Here's the second thing. I've told you that it's a mystery. It hasn't been made known in the past the way it's now being made known through the apostles and the prophets. 
of which God has called me, given me a gift to preach to you this. And what I'm supposed to preach, I'm supposed to preach to you about this mystery in the power of God, about who Christ is, about who God is, and who the church is. And then he says in that last phrase, to the authorities. Look, he said, to, let me get it right, to, to be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This is what I think he's doing, secondly. First, to preach the sound doctrine of those things. But secondly, I think that this is what he's doing. He's using the language they understand because they've been using it about their cult that's going on in there. And so I think that what he's actually saying is, is God, by his power and his grace, have called me to preach preach the truth about who Christ is, preach the truth about who God is, about the church is, and she's not it. The rulers and the principalities, heavenly places. That's who she is. She fell out of heaven. She's the one. She is the heart and soul of our life, our society, our culture. And Paul is standing right there using language that they understand. And he's saying, and God has called me to get in her face and say, you're not it. He's called me by his grace gift. He's called me to preach the word of God. Look further on down here now. So that, so that, in the mystery of the ages and God who created all things, verse 10, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus. I think that Paul is being... Um, gifted, empowered, sound doctrine to preach this, but significantly he's saying as a part, yea, as a fulfillment of the eternal purpose of God. Now, if you would just grasp that the first time I said it, you'd all just fall out. Even I would. We would just be amazed. Because what the Apostle Paul, and this is what I was meaning a little earlier about seeing into this character, into this person. He's running, he's going into this digression. He's off the beaten track a little bit, and he's into this digression, and he's talking about his ministry and what God has called, and how God has called, what God has called him to do. And, and, and then as if to say, he's, he, he's I, I want to make sure that you understand the, the motive I want you to understand why this is happening. And the real root cause of why this is happening is because this is God's eternal. What I'm doing right here is God's eternal plan. Yea, I would argue for you right now, sitting where you're sitting right now, that it is a divine appointment that you are where you are because it is a part of the eternal purpose of God. But what Paul is saying here is, is this is my calling. This is who I am. I must do this. He's not doing it out of compulsion. He's doing it out of thrill, out of joy, out of forsake. Uh, for, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 2, for the sake of the elect, I suffer all things. I'm doing this for you, he says, because it's a part of the eternal purpose of God. It's a reason that he's preaching. This is the purpose for his preaching. And now take a look at just a little bit of the light. This is who's bringing it to us. But he's bringing us the light. Look at 12. In whom we have boldness. We not only have boldness, we have access. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. Paul is saying, as he does in other places, I'm an example. Oh, he's already said I'm the least. He's not trying to step forward and say, I'm suffering on your sakes in some atoning fashion. He's not asking people to believe in Paul the way they're supposed to believe in Jesus. That's not what's happening. 
but he is saying that I am to be an example to you. And that's why I'm preaching to you. And so he says, through this, we have access. I think that's, again, back into the very presence of God, that Romans 5, 1 passage, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God, and we have access into his presence, in whom, in Christ Jesus, that is, we have access with confidence, come boldly before the throne of grace, our faith in him. Because that's what he, he seems to say, well, I, I prayed for you. You're, you're one, Jews and Gentiles together. And I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to pray for you again. But there's just a couple of things I want you to know. God's made me this minister of this grace. And it's by his power. It's according to his eternal plan. He's going to carry that out through the church. I, I remind you, where is the Apostle Paul? Where is he when he's writing this? Where is, he's in jail. He's thinking in his mind, oh, these people that I spent three years with, they're going to find out I'm in jail. They're going to find out I'm in jail, and what are they going to do? Oh, man. <laughs> Paul's in jail. Ooh. I don't know if this thing's going to work or not, you know? I mean, Paul's in jail. And he says to himself, I need to, I need to insert a word. And this is the light that we have access we have boldness and access and confidence through our faith in him. So, so, he has, so he has a request. So I ask over what I'm suffering for you, which is your glory. There it is. I may be in prison, but I want you to know everything that I am came from God and God's grace gift through his power because of his eternal purpose. It's God, 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 God. If I'm in jail, if I'm dead... God goes on. Do not lose heart. Church, don't lose heart to do the same thing that the Apostle Paul did. The Bible makes it very, very clear that each member of the body of Christ has been given a grace gift. Been given a grace gift. Just like Paul said, God gave me a gift to preach. I'm preaching. He gave us a grace gift for us to have. I, I think that We've made far too little of Jude 3. Jude only has one chapter, so we just use verses. Jude 3. That we are to contend for the faith delivered once and for all to all of the saints. Where is it, church? Where is it? I'll bring a report. I'll write a position paper on the Southern Baptist Convention, and it will go into more of this. But allow me to say that we so desperately need believers, not just pastors, but Christians of all rank and file, to know what they believe and why they believe it and able to stand on two feet and contend for the faith delivered once and for all to all the saints. We've been entrusted with that. And the Apostle Paul is standing here. He's thinking about these people that he loves. He's thinking about the church. He's in prison. He's concerned that they are going to waver in their faith because of his situation. And he says, let me tell you about God. Let me tell you about Jesus and the eternal plan that God has for carrying out all things through the church. Which brings me to my last point of application. That simply is this that we are to give ourselves to the same thing that the Apostle Paul was giving himself to in this text. We're to give ourselves to the church, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, the family of God. We are to give ourselves for what he gave himself for. Do not say that we love the groom and we don't love the bride. Where are God's people in this 21st century where membership is going down, where attendance is so flippant that we attend Wheel of Fortune far more faithfully than we do the Church of the Living God. He gave himself for it. Oh, well, you know, I, I, I've served in the nursery for 10 years. It's time for somebody else to do it. William 
steal helped 800 slaves flee from slavery. And all the while, he was writing, he met with each one of them and wrote down their biographies, knowing that if anyone ever found his diary, that that would mean his life. You know, you know what he'd, he'd write this down in a diary and then he would go and visit the cemetery and he'd take his diary and he hid it in a crypt. And every time he needed to write again and he'd go back to the cemetery into the crypt and he'd pull it back out when he helped somebody else. And when the laws would shift and change, he would find another course of action to go this way or that way. Finally, you know, Philadelphia wasn't enough, New York wasn't enough, Ohio wasn't enough, had to go to Canada to get people free. I told you about William Steele being the 14th child after his mom moved to New Jersey. She left those two boys behind, Levin and Peter. Uh, it's reported that Levin was beaten to death. Uh, not sure whether it was Kentucky or Alabama. He was beaten to death. But one day, William Steele was in his office in Philadelphia, and a black man came in, and he said, I've got a family. i got a family in Alabama that I so desperately want to try and get onto the Underground Railroad to get them out. And, and William Steele said, well, tell me about yourself. And the man said, well, my name's Peter, and I've got a wife and, and five kids. Uh, my mother left me when I was very young in Maryland, and I was sold to Kentucky and then sold again to Alabama and much in the reminiscent I would suspect of Joseph in Egypt about his brothers William Steele's eyes just began to water over and he was sitting there looking at his long lost brother and helped he and his family escape slavery William Steele was, was a person ready to stand where he stood to serve like he did his whole life regardless of the consequences. I believe that he was a Christian. It's not exact right there. But my friends, I, I, I bring this digression to you as something that's really impacted me this week in studying it. I am begging you find your whole joy and your delight and your satisfaction not in this shifting sand of a world but in your eternal purpose in God why are you here why are you on planet earth and I would go so far as to say that needs to be lived out in the bride of Christ the body of Christ it needs to be lived out in the church because Christ has died for the church he took your sins and my sins upon himself when we should have borne them he did in our place and that by grace through faith if we believe that God's wrath his anger is taken off of us and put on Jesus who died and rose again that we could be about our heavenly father's business in, in, in glorifying him through good works that he has made for us to walk in as a part of his eternal purpose. It's a mystery. Pray with me, would you? Lord, I thank you for your word. It's so rich. I pray, Holy Spirit, do what no preacher can do. That is, implant the word, graft it into us. Um, put that seed so deep into fertile soil that the people who are in the sound of my voice this morning who know you will hear you, will be by your spirit engulfed by the truth of the grace gift that they've been given and the desire to be one who is faithful to the faith and live out their God-given calling as 
a part of your huge, magnificent, God-honoring, Christ-glorifying eternal purpose. In Jesus' name.